I think a lot of time people need to learn to be content with what they have first and then try and, try and for aim more. for something else forward. Yeah. If you keep thinking, I'm not going to be content until I have that. the next thing or the next thing or the next you thing. You will never get that thing. You will never get that thing. Yeah. Yeah. It will always just be there. You will always be just be chasing after it and it will always keep running away from you. So it was- What is going on guys? Welcome back to CEO Cast. I'm your host Raheem and today I'm back doing another podcast with someone I'd like to call a friend of CEO Cast, a supporter and he's been on the podcast before. It was during lockdown so it was on Zoom and I thought this deserves the best quality so we need to redo it. And with that being said, I'm with Imran Arshad from Evolve Automotive, Even Chewy, 660, the best entrepreneur that I've is inspiration basically so oh, thank you bro <laughs> how you doing man <laughs> yeah very well and thanks for having me back on i know when we did the original podcast it was under lockdown and a yeah. bit extreme situation so it was, it was all a bit yeah weird to, so to be fair i should have been patient with that podcast because I, I wanted to meet you and i think it was just in a bit of a rush at the time and and now that i look back at it i don't know why but i didn't seem fully confident i, was, I don't know why i felt like nervous on the podcast or okay. something. <laughs> so yeah i thought it was only right to do a part two really um, but with that being said, for the people who haven't seen that one necessarily, what is it that you do? So I'm, um, as you said, an entrepreneur. I don't like using that word myself, but I've like the got uh, four brands now or businesses mm. that relate to the aftermarket in uh, automotive. Yeah. So I've got Evolve Automotive, which is a tuning company, uh, more or less specializing in BMWs, but we do do other stuff. Um, then we've got Eventuri, which is a carbon fiber intake manufacturer. And 660, which is the wheels that you see behind us. Yeah. And then we're just starting a new brand, which is called Evero. And that's for carbon fiber body kits. And yeah. we're going to launch that in a, in a couple of months. Okay, wicked, wicked. So for people who, who are watching this and they want to know more about business and not necessarily car guys, what is a carbon fiber intake? What are carbon fiber parts of the car? What do they do? Okay, so for example, uh, carbon fiber intake is uh, replaces the stock factory airbox, which yeah. then allows the car to make more power mm. and it looks aesthetically pleasing under the bonnet. So a lot of people show cars would like to buy them and people who go on track like to the extra performance. Um, in terms of carbon fiber aero body kits I'm talking about, they are initially going to be just for aesthetics. So it's just like putting front splitter, rear spoiler, rear diffuser on your car. Yeah. Uh, but for EV cars uh, that are getting very popular now, we are going to design a range of uh, parts that actually make the car more aerodynamic, which then increase the range. So, so something like a Tesla? Yeah, that's why we have a Tesla. Okay, <laughs> oh, that makes sense now. Yeah. <laughs> no, fair enough. If you were wondering why we bought a Tesla, that is the reason. I was actually going to ask you, like, throughout some point in the podcast, that obviously government are trying to make the, like a lot of EV vehicles on yes. the road, basically. So, so that's a way you're going to push into that side of the business, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I don't, my mind doesn't sit still. It's a gift and a curse at the same time. So yeah. I'm thinking five years ahead, six years ahead, what's going on? Mm. And I've been thinking about this for a long time because ECU tuning was one of our main businesses and then car manufacturers were making it more and more difficult to get to crack the ECUs. into ECUs. And this was my main push towards aesthetics and like wheels and carbon fiber aero parts because it was like, you know, it doesn't matter if the cars go electric eventually or we can't tune the cars. Yeah. At least we can do something. I've got the network. I've got the brand name. We can still utilize the infrastructure we have in place yeah. to, to have a successful business. And now we've seen the rise of EV cars even more. And that decision I made four or five years ago is now really coming into, yeah, into, into play. place. So, you know, Evero, obviously right now you're making uh, carbon parts for, for example, your M3, M5, mm-hmm. etc. But was the main soul of the business to eventually tap into the EV vehicles and so you can have something to rely on in that sense. Yeah, hundred percent. So obviously, it was easy for us to make the parts for the cars that we have. Yeah, uh, the, you've the got process them. we yeah. have is we th- we use cutting edge technology. So we three D scan the parts, we design everything in CAD. Yeah, we three D print the prototypes, we test fit them, and then they go to our carbon manufacturers to be made. Mm. Um, so we started with the cars that we had, and then we were like, I, I need to start doing this for EV cars because that was always the intention yeah. at the beginning. Uh, so we bought the Tesla for that reason. I've already designed a kit for 
uh, BMW i3 for a project, oh, uh, which is going to. I put pictures of the i3 up before on my Instagram. My, was it yeah. over a month ago or something? Yeah, yeah. It, it first time was actually a year ago because oh, I designed a yeah. concept for somebody else um, for a deal I can't talk about at the moment. Yeah, that was fine. If that deal doesn't come through, then I'm going to do it myself, if that makes sense. So, so I was contracted by somebody else to, to oh, make that okay. design. I think I've clocked on. Okay, maybe. so um, <laughs> so I'm getting an i3 as well now yeah. so I can complete that mm. project. So the, the intention was always to do that. And if you look at Tesla not just EV cars, but Tesla Model 3 is one of the best-selling cars in the world now. They can't even keep up I think with demand. I think it's a decent price for an EV car, isn't it? What is it, 35 grand plus VAT or something? Yeah. You know, and it, it does everything pretty well. I mean, yeah. It doesn't make a noise, but it's fast. The Model S and the Model... Is it Y or X? The X, G, SUV the, one. Yeah, SUV, yeah. Um, almost 100 grand, aren't they? Very expensive. Yeah. So for that to come in that price range, it's literally taking the market of a 3 Series. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to give you an example, my business partner Bilal is a petrol head. He loves cars. He loves M cars. We yeah. have, you know, we share ownership of a lot of cars. Mm. And he drives his Tesla and he doesn't really care about anything yeah. else anymore. It's like we tried to get him to drive the car somewhere. Yeah. It's like reluctantly he would pick up the keys. It's, yeah, no, I mean, like, it does everything so well. Yeah. yeah, you gave me the tour earlier and, you know, you're show- pointing me out Bilal's cars and saying, yep, he's driven that once, yeah. driven that twice, <laughs> yeah, that exactly. one none. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think that's really interesting. That's a great way to start the podcast, to be fair. But in the previous podcast, we did mention how how it all started. Mm-hmm. Let's just give a brief, not not the whole thing, but just a okay. briefing yeah, of how yeah, it started. Yeah, so um, I've got a law degree. And then after I finished my law degree, I wanted to try something different. So I went into commercial sales. Um, after a couple of years, I decided to go and do my LPC, which is my legal practice course, because you have to do it within seven years of doing the degree. I yeah. thought just in case I want to become a lawyer, I might as well just do it, yeah go and do it and then after I finished my LPC I worked for the legal regulation authority for a couple of years and while I was there I started to do some uh, kind of online sales for car parts yeah so I had a Z3M coupe at the time and I was developing uh, some parts with other companies and I got into that community they started buying parts off me and um, after a while I thought I can make like a business out oh, of this, this the yeah. revenue kind of got to a point where I had to make that jump I was very comfortable with the salary I was mm. on but then that was building up and it, you know you when you have a side hustle it gets to a point where you have to make that jump between you can either choose between you want to stay where you are or go take that full time basically yeah. and that's a, a very difficult jump to make and that's where most people will fall down because you have to forego the guaranteed salary every month and get a little bit uncomfortable yeah. it's a risk and isn't it it's a, massive it's a big risk. big risk um but as they say no risk no reward right that's that's the that's what business is yeah um so i took that risk uh for three four years i didn't really get paid uh properly but eventually it it paid off and yeah. then that's where evolve grew out of um that got to a, a really good level and then eventually came about because uh, bilal approached me and said, I've I've got something revolutionary for intakes. No one's tried it before. Can I try it out in your car? And I've known Bilal for ages through the car community, community essentially. Yeah. Uh, so he came, we tested a product out on my E60 M5 at that time. That was 2013, I think. Mm. And I was blown away with the way the product was working. And I said, look, we need to do something with this. So we essentially set up Even Chewy together because yeah. he has the technical skills and he recognized the fact that I was very good at sales and marketing. And I already had kind of a dealer network yeah, set up so it's slotted yeah. in yeah, very well enough. um and then the, with the wheel 660 again my business partner taron for that had been in the wheel game for ages and he approached me and said i want to do something mm. together which and are displayed behind. yeah which are the ones you yeah. see uh behind me so again so all of our demo cars obviously run yeah those wheels as yeah. well apart from the e39 because that's on bbs lms from back in the day so you I'm, don't want to take them off i don't want to take <laughs> them off Fair i enough. leave them on there yeah. um that kind of is, is of that time p- period um, and then Ivero has started now uh, with me and Bilal again because we've th- th- we're using the same infrastructure, yeah. like same employees, same processes, same carbon fiber supply suppliers. It's just making a different shape product, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but um, we're not. Bilal's not designing that, so he designs all of our intakes. Yeah, um, and he's full time on that. And the aero stuff requires a slightly different skill set. So the way it works with that is I will sketch the initial ideas and I work with a 3D designer yeah. and then we get the designs where we want them. And then we do the same process we do for even Chewy. So we 3D scan, we we prototype, we test fit. And then when we're happy, we say, okay, we'll, we'll push the button on it. So with um, the Aero, does it, 
the, the, like the ones you designed, are they actually um, better performing for the arrow? No, so initially what we're doing styling? is we were making them um, downforce neutral. So yeah. we do actually put them through a simulation and make sure they're not negatively okay, yeah. affecting it. What does that mean? So it's not causing drag. Okay. So what we want it to be is we want it to have hardly any effect for the aesthetic parts. Okay, we want it to okay. be put it on and not have cause drag where it actually... Just a neutral causes, behavior. Yeah, neutral behavior to keep it similar to what it is yeah. standard. Um if there is a need or a demand for it, we will make parts that do actually produce downfalls because yeah. we can do that. But at the moment, we're doing it purely for aesthetics, aesthetics initially. Yeah. And then we're doing it for EV cars mm. to improve uh, the drag. So therefore, they have more range. Yeah. And what you're talking about is more like for race cars where you want them to go around the track and, yeah, yeah, and actually have more downforce and grip while they're going around the track. Um, there are lots of other people doing that and that's more race orientated. We want to go for more of a mass market. Yeah, and like that's a why we're going sort of that way. But we can and are capable of mm. doing that. So it's a business choice that we've yeah, yeah, not taken. I mean, I, I like functional stuff, but I've actually gone the other way <laughs> because that's where I see the business yeah. growing. No, but the, you know what? There's two sides of it. You can make your car really fast, which Evolve does. And then you can also make it really look, look really good, which the yeah, Aero does. does. Yep. Yeah. So I guess that's really good what you've done. But you know what? I want to ask this question, but I hope you don't mind me asking you. Mm -hmm. yeah? How do we, I say we, I mean you and below and, you know, Taryn, how do you, how do you make a company go from, from nothing to something like this? Your, I mean, your unit, I'll get some shots of it, 100%. 14,000 square foot, you said, isn't it? Yeah. Which is massive, split into two, one side, even mm -hmm. other side evolve. What kind of steps do you have to take into, when, okay, let me ask you this question for the start off here. Yeah? When do you know it is the time to expand to a 14,000 square foot unit? I'll be honest with you. Every step you take, mm. like I started in my parents' bedroom. Yeah. The step from that to going to a service office, then the step from that going to your first unit, which our first unit was 1,100 square foot. We ordered yeah. a dyno, like without even having the unit. I mean, 1,100 square paperwork. foot compared to this yeah. is... So um, when we got that unit, the legal side of it was taking so long. The dyno arrived and was sitting at docks for three months. Like yeah, we didn't even know saying, at yeah. that point, like if it was going to work or what was going to happen. Um, and then the next stage from that was 2000 square foot. So we doubled. Yeah. And now we've gone from double to seven times. And if you're asking when is the right time is for us, it's been, we can't kind of operate anymore from this space. Yeah. And we have to make the jump. And every jump we've made has been, nerve-wracking even though i've done that probably five times in in business now yeah and especially this one we saw this place we saw the rent we saw how big it was we we're like this is too big it's too much of a risk then we couldn't find anything then me and Bilal had a talk and we were like we just have to do honestly, it yeah. we just have to do it yeah. and literally it was just a leap of faith so how do you so like you said it was a big risk and you know it's it's a big expense and stuff like that but what you explained to me off camera earlier is it's basically made the business pick up in every section. Yeah, so I spoke to the way, you know, you have to, there's people that are more experienced than you. And what I did was, I've been mm. in business for 13 years, right? Yeah. But there's people more experienced than me. So I go talk to those people who are, who are doing even bigger things than I am, who have been around longer than me. Yeah. And I explained the situation. Every single one of them said, you just have to do it. It's just those what are you worried about? Yeah. They they all said you have to do it, and you watch what happens when you move into this space. When you see how much space you have, mm. things will happen, and they weren't wrong. And this is comes down to experience, right? I've had that experience before, but because this jump was so much bigger, yeah, than I had ever done before, I needed that kind of reassurance from people. And even me, when I'm experienced, and people come to me for advice, I still go to other people <laughs> for advice, and I always will because I don't know everything, and I never will. And I think. From experience, that that's what you learn. It doesn't matter how much you know. You mm. don't know everything. And there's always people that know, know more than more, you, yeah. who are more experienced than you that can help and guide you. And I still have people around yeah. me that are, I, are even bigger than I am, that, that have been doing it longer than me, that I respect them, and I will go to them for advice. So here's a question. How do you get into the same room? How do you network with those people who know more or more experience and stuff like that? That's an interesting question because I just have that kind of personality. I'm kind of talkative. Yeah. I get on with people. The amount of people I've now met within this industry is just is crazy. It's the products we make and then the people we sell to and then 
who they're linked with. And it's literally just about, you know, if you see my Instagram, I travel when I can. Yeah, I yeah. travel a lot, not right now, but that's to meet our distributors, to have face-to-face contact with them because everyone relies on online and everything now, but you cannot beat for me having that face-to-face. personal interaction. So all of our big distributors will go and meet them at least once mm. at their own in their own country. Yeah, And then a lot of the time we will then see them at trade shows like uh, Tokyo Hot Salon, SEMA, uh, SN Motor Show. So some of them I'll end up seeing like four times and going out and having a meal with them. Yeah. And when you say getting in the same room, it's just happened organically. I, I've never like tried to force it. But now it's got to a point where uh, if I want to get into somebody, I'll think who might know them out of my network. Yeah. And I'll just... Who can open like, that I'll door? just WhatsApp like people on my phone. Like yeah, that, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing that I can like WhatsApp somebody and I say, do you know this guy? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's my mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, can you do an intro? And then they just say, yeah, fine. I'll, then they email us by intro, like email intro us, and that's it. Yeah. And that's, it. You, know that's you know, having a network is so important because it makes things so much yeah. easier. And you're not having to knock a door down. The door basically just gets open for open you. Open for you. That, you know, it's funny you say that because that same technique that you basically said is the exact same thing I use to get guests on the podcast, whether it may be people like Ricky, people like Aleem, people like eh, whoever comes on a podcast is because sometimes half the times I've DM'd them myself or I know someone who knows them and, you know, it just gets the yeah. ball rolling like that. So that's quite interesting. And but do you know what? Going back to what we were saying about the unit, it's funny now because it doesn't seem too long ago that you got this unit. I remember it feels like, yeah, exactly. It's been a year, a year ago. Look at the Look at what we're having to build already and yeah. make it even bigger. I mean, it was a year ago you uploaded the video where you got the new unit. Yeah, it, it was, was empty. Empty, <laughs> yeah. And now I'll... I will get, once again get some shots of it, but it is packed in every corner yeah. and you're having to build another floor. So do you think you're going to move out anytime soon or what do you think? Yeah, we're going to need to. I mean, the only other uh, expansion we can have is to build a mezzanine over the Evolve workshop area. Yeah. Um, but we really oh, want side to... side here. Yeah, over this side here. Yeah. But we really want to do a design and build to actually have our own yeah building so ideally we need a bit of land where we can build our design and build to make it like a proper showroom and make it how we want it yeah and then have more space to expand from there yeah. so yeah i don't think this place will last us another two three years is that the know. next step after this that's the next step that was this that was meant to be the step this time but yeah. just couldn't make it happen why is that couldn't find the land couldn't mm. find people to do the design and build it's just like very difficult because right? ideally you want to keep it in Luton, isn't it yeah, because all the staff are from here. So, you know, we employ between the two companies, we employ um, probably around 20 staff now. Yeah. Everyone's local. Some of them come like on, on bikes, scooters and stuff. So we can't really shift mm. out because then how do they get to work? Yeah, It becomes exactly, difficult. Yeah. And then like <laughs> recruiting people is one of the most difficult things about a business. And like if you have a good team of people, uh, you can't replace them. So it becomes difficult. Yeah, no, I can imagine. And to be fair, you know... Um, you never really think about these things when you're watching your YouTube videos or you're looking at Instagram of how many, how many, how much stuff you have here. Yeah. I mean, when you said 20, even in, in the production, the production alone, area, yeah. it's 10. 10 there, yeah. And do you know what I mean? It's just like, there's a lot that goes into this business. And that's why I wanted to do this podcast because the last one we've done was all about how it started. Yeah. Now it's kind of different of going behind the scenes and mm-hmm. how you've got to where you're at now. So what's the next step for all four brands and businesses next step is to use all of these brands and businesses have been building up to one thing and that's essentially to create our own cars oh seriously basically yeah so if you know if you if we have like an evolve x5 for example just take that as an example and it has evero parts on it it, and it has wheels on it and it has like MSS suspension and all these brands that we work with Mm. but then we get they're our brands yeah so then everything is extremely cheap to us yeah. because we're getting it at a manufacturer rate. Right? Yeah. And then we can build like literally branded cars and that's the next step for me. So something like, um, uh, what's that BMW one called? The B7s and the... Oh, Alpina. Alpina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's Alpina it, yeah. is a more of a manufacturer, but initially we will start just by putting out the cars. Yeah. With all, so you can buy a brand new car with all our parts on it yeah. at, at a really good rate because, you know maybe we get a good discount on the car and then we got all the parts at a discount mm. to make it really attractive more like what i guess urban do for yeah Range it's, a, it's a branded a rebrand of the original yeah manufacturer yeah which is quite sick so would you do that for all brands or specify initially we would thing? start with 
BMW because that, yeah, I that's just, what you know best. I just know best, right? So everything for me, BMW is always my test bed yeah. for everything because we have very good penetration to the market in terms of like dealers and resellers and also marketing because mm. our marketing on YouTube is very kind of BMW based because that's what yeah. the cars we have. And leading on to that, is that how the BMW contract with Park Lane came about? Um, yeah, so they noticed us on social media, on LinkedIn. Uh, so LinkedIn is very underrated social media platform because people don't use it properly. But yeah. if you want to do stuff at a higher level, that's where all the directors oh, are, right? Yeah. They're not on Instagram. <laughs> well, <laughs> I am, but you know, that generally, because I have to be on Instagram for my social media marketing. Yeah. So yeah, they noticed us on uh, LinkedIn, noticed us on, on YouTube and noticed the content that we're putting out. Mm. And the managing director from uh, BMW Park Lane got in contact with us and asked us to do content for them, essentially. So yeah, I'm, I, do, I do content that goes onto their YouTube channel. Yeah, I borrow their cars to do content on our channel. Mm. I also refer customers to them yeah. as well. So it works really well. For someone who wants to, for example, make their own wheels or any sort of brand, in your experience, what's the what's the like process behind it? You like from the idea to for me or for some, someone who's not in the industry? Because that's two very someone, different things. Someone who's not in the industry. Someone like who's not to them, in what the industry. To do. It's difficult. Like I, say, I mean, you'd have to find, like, if you have no experience of doing this, yeah. then you obviously have to, number one, sort your branding out. Yeah. So you've got a nice brand. And then number two, you have to sort the design out. If you don't know how to do that, you'd have to find an external company who's capable of designing the wheels for you yeah. and thinking about what concepts you want to come up with. And then you'd have to find the person to manufacture it. There's lots of manufacturers out there. Mm. Then you'd have to find the right person to manufacture the wheel for you. Then you'd have to market it. Yeah, and yeah. And get it into the same. I mean, get yeah. it into people who can resell it for you or or trust that you're producing a good product. Yeah. I mean, you made it sound easy, but probably a lot harder than that. <laughs> well, yeah, it's easy for someone like me because I, I've been in the industry for ages, so I know who makes good stuff. I know people who can, like, as I said, I can sketch the designs, but then I need them made into 3D. Yeah. Um, it's easy to do it, mm. and I I think anyone would be able to produce a wheel design, but then selling it's a different. different so you, story. you know you design these wheels, yeah? Not all of them. So some I design, some ta- uh, my business partner designs. So we designs, split yeah. them between so us. So from the actual, I'm, I'm guessing you sketch it on paper. Yeah, so, yeah. So then from that, how soon can you receive the actual alloy? Five weeks. Six Seriously. Weeks? Yeah. That's, it. That's the quickest. Yeah. Like, the, the, say for example, I sketch a design and then I go to a 3D artist. Mm. And then because I've been working with a 3D artist for quite a while, when I sketch something, they kind of already know what I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does they that make sense? Because yeah. we've been through that whole back and forward, you need to change this, you need to do that. Yeah. And most of the time they'll get it in one go. They'll understand they my know, vision yeah. because we've worked so well together and they'll say, okay, this is, and then maybe I make one or two tweaks. Mm. From sketch to 3D design process, if everything's going smoothly, that can take like one week. Yeah. Yeah, maybe two. It just depends on how busy everyone is and how many back and forwards there are. Um, and then once it goes to the company who's machining the wheels, because these are all forged wheels, so they're machined out of a single block of billet. Yeah, so um, for people who don't know what forged means, that's... Yeah, so it's machined out of a single yeah. piece. There's no welding or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, it's so that's why they're so strong, light yeah. and expensive. So what most people are used to is cast wheels. Yeah. And that's melted metal into a, in, poured into a cast. Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah, not as strong, way. not as light. Um, but this is like, has very strong uh, structure because it's one piece essentially. Yeah, yeah. So, nice. then, so then, yeah, so if we go back to the process, then from... 3D render to production is anywhere between four and eight weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay, so we have done, we have done, so those magnesium wheels you see behind you, these brown ones here, they were made for SEMA in three weeks from design to build. Seriously? Yeah. So where are they manufactured? So these ones are manufactured in Taiwan. Okay, so they even got come a long way as well. Shipping alone probably takes probably two weeks. Uh, One week. Yeah, so I mean, essentially from Designed to finish in the wheel, excluding, are you excluding like delivery time? No, I'm including delivery time. So excluding the delivery time, they can get it done within a week or two. Yeah, if it's if it's rushed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that is possible. <laughs> but it doesn't I mean, happen all the time. I and mean, that was a special. Yeah. Uh, 
special event which we had to kind of do so everyone kind of pulled out yeah. the stops because obviously everyone has their they all have you know pre-existing orders which have to go through but mm. that is possible if you need to do it so just to explain the engineering or shall i say performance side of it what mm-hmm. what is it that I actually do a wheel so li- like lightweight wheel, for example yeah, yeah so a uh, lightweight wheel basically reduces the rotational mass on the car and the unsprung weight yeah so it allows the car to handle better and accelerate faster and stop better because it's not when the car is like rolling, it can accelerate faster. Mm. When you brake, it's not having that whole weight to rotation yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to slow down. Would it be something that can, like an average Joe can just tell the difference? Yeah, I think most people, if you're into cars and you can kind, kind of, of work, it work out what's going on with your car and how it feels, yeah, yeah you would. But mm-hmm. I mean, forge wheels, obviously, make, they're, again, they're aesthetic part as mm. well. The performance side of it is there, but most people, I'll be honest, will buy for yeah. the, 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 how it looks. So I've got a question, um, and I'm I'm just intrigued to know. It might be a really simple answer for you. I mm-hmm. just want to know what was your decision for buying the Cooper what's the it GP3 called? GP3? Yeah, because um, I, I yeah, mean so that's a complete opposite car from everything that you got. I mean, it's performance orientated, but I've always had a yeah. Mini. So from R56, I've always had a Cooper S because yeah. I love them. I just think they're fun, and yeah. most of the time, I daily. That's what I daily. Yeah. Can you fit in them? Hmm? Can you fit in it? What? The mini? mini? Yeah. Yes, I'm not that big, man. I'm five I can't, nine. No, but you, okay, you're not that shorter than me, but I mean, I can't fit in it at all. Yeah. I find it terrible. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> to get so, yeah, so it. I've always had, mi- I, like, I really like minis. Yeah. Uh, number one, it kind of fits in the whole BMW brand anyway. Yeah. But I've always, I had an R56 Cooper S, which we tuned and like we did everything to. Is it easy stuff to produce? Because essentially, would you say like they come from BMW, like the parts? That doesn't make a difference to us. No? No. That doesn't make a difference to us. It just helps in terms of marketing so when we started doing mini tuning which is actually really big for us yeah when we started r56 we went into that market and no one said who are you okay because people looked into us they say oh they they tune bmws yeah therefore they have a right to kind of be in the mini market because yeah. it kind of goes together it right kind of relates to mini so, BMW, so when yeah. i when when we stepped into that market in what 2011 or something it was very easy for us just to yeah, go just in and no one could say to us who are you guys why are you tuning <laughs> yeah minis uh and literally from that time i just liked the cars they were just a lot mm. of fun i drove that car a lot and then uh we bought the f56 cooper s i think 2017 f56 is that shape is it's it? that yeah. shape but we had a normal cooper s yeah, yeah, yeah. and again we yeah we tuned that and we do a lot of like because we tune worldwide we don't just tune from here yeah um, if I was relying on cars coming to this location to be tuned, I wouldn't be doing that business because it's just not scalable. What, the tuning? Yeah. How so do you we, tune worldwide? Though? Remotely. So we have a tool which gets sent out to the customer. They read yeah. out the ECU data from their car, uh, email it to us, we tune mm. it and we send it back. Simple as that? Yeah. So they're yeah. What, what we would call off the shelf tunes. So they're like stage one, stage two that are set like really safe. You yeah. can get a bit more power out of them by custom tuning them. But most people don't, they're happy having a safe, reliable tune that works and therefore it then becomes scalable because yeah. if if we can only, like if we were tuning cars in-house, we only, we'd kind of limit ourselves to two a day yeah. because we don't really want to do more than that. We want to spend time on, on doing it. Um, but if you're doing them remotely, we can 10, 15, 20, does, you know. That's, that's an interesting topic, number. yeah. How do you know when a business or a sector of a business is scalable on a global scale? Because we all talk about this in the last podcast that even Chewy, it's, it's a global brand basically so it's evolved because you're yeah. doing the tune like what, how do you know when something you can scale it to that level you don't know you produce a good product and yeah. as long as that product can then be shipped yeah everywhere it's scalable. but you've got to have that sort of idea in your head like that it can be shipped to xyz or for example i didn't know you could do remote tuning yeah but if I wanted to get in tuning, I wouldn't have that in my hand, mind thinking well, I can do this remotely. That's a lack of knowledge then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's a lack of a business I should <laughs> to do. To me, it's like I kind of know everything's... <laughs> sca- if you can make a product and yeah. it can be shipped easily, then it's possible for it to scale. But then that also relies on how much you're buying the product for, yeah. how much margin you're giving to your dealers and distributors because everyone will want a cut yeah. along the way. Um, what I found is that in the early days we were producing the products ourselves and trying to sell everything ourselves. Yeah. And then it's less scalable. But okay. if you provide margins to distributors, like for even Churi, we have one distributor in America, one in Germany. So I only have one customer in America. 
Those in the only, distributor, yeah. Yeah, who's the distributor? And then yeah. they basically then sell to their dealers, yeah, who, who then sell, sell to, to, to the end user. Yeah. So okay. that that's when it becomes truly scalable because it's not just you doing the marketing, you trying to sell it. It's like we don't do any marketing in America. Whatever mm. we do in terms of YouTube and Instagram might kind of carry over there a little yeah. bit. And I guess it's content, but then yeah. our distributors doing marketing, then all their dealers are doing yeah. marketing. So they're yeah, doing the sales true, yeah. for you. Yeah, because you're having got to then the give up some well, yeah. margin, right? Yeah. But a lot of people think, I want to make the product myself. I want to sell it directly. I want to take all the margin, yeah. which is fine. You get all the margin, but then you're how's gonna, your volume? Exactly. Yeah, just yeah. can say that you're going to sell less. Yeah. But then in your case, because I guess the margins are smaller, but because you're selling a lot more, it weighs out, doesn't it? Yeah, of course it, it does. Because yeah. I've seen this and I've, I've been through that process. And then once you see like the volume coming in, yeah. like you can't compete on the margin anymore. It's like, it's, it's much better. Going back to the beginning of the podcast, obviously, we've done the last one in lockdown. Lockdown's kind of eased now. Businesses, would you say business is picking up a lot more now? Business did not stop for us. Even through our lockdown. lockdown. I remember you saying that in lockdown. Absolutely yeah. crazy. I think it's, I've tried to, I've had this conversation with other people who have similar business to us. And the only thing I can put it down to is people were furloughed. They have more, they actually have more money, especially our clientele. They're not going to work. They're not commuting. They're not spending money on petrol. They're not spending money on going out. Yeah. If they were going on one or two family holidays a year, they save that money. Yeah. And they have to, people just like to spend money, right? This retail therapy. But there's no way to spend. But then they were buying car parts that they could either fit themselves or go to their friends to fit. Or yeah. like, especially with the tuning, they can do it themselves. It's designed as a DIY. Yeah thing so like world over it was just absolutely insane i think we had uh probably three of our best months we've ever had in our history during the last that's three that's months. amazing to hear because every other business i've spoken to is it impacted them they've closed down or something but it's impacted them in a negative way but for you it's the complete opposite isn't it like, so far it's been absolutely positive yeah. but i think that come again it comes down to having good product good marketing yeah good customer service, like everything is in place to be good. And then because we are scalable and we have distributors across the whole world, we've kind of been insulated from it, from every country, if that makes sense. So like we sell a lot to China. Okay, China yeah. went into lockdown right at the beginning, yeah. six weeks. They came out of it six weeks. They were done. Yeah, We started selling stuff. Back there again, yeah. Back to China again, like, like crazy yeah. and america because america's so big and they've got little pockets that are, are being but, affected yeah. by it the whole country's not being affected so they're yeah. still it's just like some states and some that yeah. aren't that yeah yeah correct. Well, that makes sense so then um i mean would you say it's grown in the time of lockdown like is there is it a lot more busy and i mean your showroom your your workshop looks packed <laughs> yeah i mean the so, workshops like a lot of it's our cars yeah. um some of it's customer cars but i mean in general yes we closed the workshop for one month yeah and when we were allowed to open again we we opened but the decision to close wasn't because of necessarily of of covid or we had to close we weren't the type of business that had to close yeah for, for the workshop side of things it was more of a personal and a business ethical yeah, yeah decision because we didn't want to put our employees into harm's way Let, let's switch the topic into a, a statement yeah mm. um so if you're if you follow Living Life Fast, Ricky, you know that he's getting a thousand break M5, and so are you, yeah. And I believe it's, is it the first in the UK or first in Europe? First two, should I say? First, definitely in the UK, Europe. I'm not 100 yeah. percent sure of. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for Evolve? I'll be honest, it doesn't really. It's mean kind much. of expected now. I don't know. It doesn't mean much. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's yeah. like kind of. Yeah, for Ricky, yeah, okay, that's a big thing, like thousand horsepower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're five. Get, yeah. But yeah, for us, I mean, we've not done to that level before but it's just yeah i think it's kind of expected of us we're going to take it to a certain level yeah. and then and go up and before we've never like we re- we've always kind of done like stage one stage two and kind of left it there but i think the m5 is such a good platform you yeah. just want to push it a little bit further and see what we can get out of it so you see with the m5 um it's got a very similar m- engine to the previous one hasn't it yeah but those previous ones there's, there's some that are running around with a thousand or plus horsepower why is it only now that this is being it's able the to cost achieve? of the car isn't it the car's like 100 grand brand new yeah and now they're two years old you can buy them for 60 grand so yeah. and i think with the f10 um a lot of people like had problems with their engine so they were forced to then 
forge and rebuild more. it and, yeah. and put forge parts in it and then they would say okay well i would just go get the new one go a bit higher yeah. yeah so it's cost isn't it? it's cost of the car then cost of doing the forged build and then yeah. cost of the turbos and everything else that you need my, my m2 is my all-time favorite all favorite, yeah. favorite car favorite build. something you'd never sell for I would say that, but I'm a businessman at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. If someone <laughs> offers me the right money, then I'll sell it. And then, um, I mean, everybody loves that car. Like my that staff love looks, that car. Yeah. Uh, my my family love that car. My kids love it. My wife love it. But yeah. and they would say, oh, I'll never sell it. But I'm still of that. I'm still that mentality. If I need that money. You can sell it, yeah. No, if I need that money to do something. Yeah. Like a business opportunity. Mm. And I'm sure I'll sell it. Yeah, I, that doesn't bother me. How, how much does something like that cost to build? In like, for example, if you were to s- sell it, what's the asking price? I don't know because I don't want to sell it. <laughs> so there's no asking price. But if you're asking how much, it, I guess it's it, one it would of cost one a in normal case, isn't it? person um, the cost of an M2. Yeah, plus probably around thirty-five to forty k. So, so you're looking about roughly around seventy, I think. Yeah, seventy, eighty k to replicate it. Yeah. But it's the time it takes as well. That, that was done like quite quickly, the initial stage for SN Motor Show. Yeah. And then we done the, like a second round on it like a couple of months later. Yeah, no, I suppose because you're a business, obviously you guys at the time, because you're doing it for a motor show, it would come first. But if it's a customer car, it's not something that would be that quick, is it? No. No. So how long would that take? Oh, the whole process, interior, everything, it really, I mean, the interior would have to outsource. So it, It'd be about a month, I reckon. I'm going to leave some links in the description below of videos of that car and you just see how amazing it is. Like, mm. it's an like actual masterpiece of art piece. You need to display that on the Yeah, I mean, somewhere. that car is, uh, it's like famous. Yeah. I, I went to SEMA once mm. and I was on the stand, BMW M Performance stand. I was talking to a guy about the F90. It, it's the first time it's been displayed. Yeah. And I was just started talking to him and he's like, oh, what other cars do you have? I have yeah, I've got an M2 and I've made it like a GTS because BMW didn't make it. He goes, I know your car. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he knew the car. So people He's not the only know, one. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I know people that work um at BMW. Yeah. And I've been told, I don't know how true this is, that like they have an inspiration board. Yeah. And, and that's on there. One of my car is on their inspiration board. But I, I've been told that whether it's true or not, I don't know. But I, I could like probably believe, believe that. I believe it is. I believe it is. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> flip it out. Do you ever get inside information about like what cars coming out next or anything like that? Yeah, I know a few people Who that know? know people within BMW, so I have some information. Obviously, we can't give that information. There's no point even asking <laughs> that question. <laughs> Fair enough. I think a lo- what a lot of people want to know, I myself want to know as well, yeah, is how do you find the perfect or right business partner, shall I say? I mean, you've got Taron for 660, yeah. and you've got Bilal for even Churi. Mm-hmm. How do you find the right business partner? Because I've been in some situations for previous businesses where it doesn't necessarily work out and there's hidden agendas and you yeah. know stuff like that so how do you find the right person yeah you find the right that's a very difficult difficult situation like difficult question um i think for me it came down to uh having the wrong business partner first yeah. right and then you realize everything that's wrong yeah and like it's almost like a marriage so when you have a business partner and your business is actually doing quite well when you have to separate, it's very difficult because it's almost like a divorce, right? Oh, you both got so assets, you both got that, investments. Yeah. <laughs> then it's like, who gets what and how do you split it? And yeah. if one person's buying other one's share, how is it valued? And mm. is one person going to accept it? Who's going to leave? It's messy. It's really messy. And I didn't know that when I was going into business. You yeah, just yeah, think, oh, yeah, I know I. this guy. He seems good. Let's just go into business. And to be fair, when you're building it with somebody, it's much easier, right? Your burden's... Yeah. reduced it's hard doing it on your own there's a lot of risk but yeah. if, i guess if you share that risk it's a yeah it becomes easier right and then you have you. different inputs from different people different people have different skill sets right yeah. so that that helps one thing i've probably learned since having been through that process is when you have a business try and have it so it's not 50 50 because no one has power yeah to make a decision that needs to be made and that's usually where the um, the floor disagreements, disagreements happen, right? Yeah. Because someone wants to go in one way, someone wants to go another way, and you can't make a decision because not one person has controlling yeah. um, shares, right, over, uh, to make that decision. So if you are going to go 50-50, I would put into like a shareholders agreement that if you two can't agree something, you have to go to a, a third, third party person, yeah. who both of you will listen to. Maybe it's your accountant, maybe whoever it is. And that has to be binding, right? 
like you you've signed that document <laughs> yeah. right? it's like, okay i think this he thinks this what do you think mm. and then whatever they say goes and if you can work like that that's fine yeah otherwise you have to have a business where one person has more of a share than the other more of a share than the other and then has the ultimate say over would you decisions. say would you say picking your business partner comes down to uh how much they can invest as well like i had this conversation with one of my friends and he was saying yeah find a business partner who can invest heavily into you and i replied and we were having a debate about this i replied saying for me it's not about the finances it's about the skill set what they can actually bring to the table yeah i would agree with you because like a lot of people could have money to invest but they, but they might not necessarily be the correct business partner for yeah. you or they have stupid expectations because mm. they don't understand the business that you're going into yeah so i would always pick somebody who has a skill set mm. rather than the money but if you need the money then that person needs to be i guess a silent yeah, partner yeah, yeah. if they don't understand if if that's the way you want to do it then that's fine but if they don't know anything about the business and they're coming in and they're not silent, yeah. then you're going to have issues. And how do you... Uh, so let me let me explain this in my situation. So right now, with because I've got a media business, I've got someone who um, who wants to essentially be like a business partner. Yeah. But for me, I don't... Not that I don't see them as a business partner, but I don't see the skill set, exactly what I was saying earlier. It's just, I can see they see it as financial resource, basically. Yeah. So how do you make the difference between a partnership, a collaboration, and a business partner do you, do you get what i'm trying yeah, to say i understand what you mean um i've not been in that situation where i've had a business partner just for yeah. funding um all of my businesses have been co- true collaborations yeah. where two people are able to bring in two different types of skill sets two different networks their own money into the yeah. business and being able to flourish that way i'm not so far been in a position where we've needed to have a business partner just for that the money but i can understand how that situation would arise well done, yeah. i think it just comes down to again just everyone being clear about what their intentions are what yeah. they expect what is it going to get you is it going to get you to a level where you can't get to yourself mm. in a year two years and then you're essentially sacrificing time for for the share right yeah, and then yeah, you have yeah. to think okay if this is going to take me Five years or I can't get to that stage because what they bring into the table allows me to do so much stuff. Yeah. That's for you to have a look at the specifics of that and make a decision from there. Bloody hell. And there's there's one thing I want to ask you. If, I'm, I'm being selfish with this podcast because <laughs> I'm asking for my own thing. So I'm doing like a media business sort of thing, you know, like wedding videography, mm-hmm. nikahs, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I want to make it different. I don't want it to just be a place where you see me on Instagram and hire me. I want it to be a place where you, uh, a unit where you come down to and there's like four different rooms, two sets for the CEO, car studios and then editors, boardroom, all that stuff, yeah. How do I go around finding the perfect unit and what's the cost involved in that? Do you need a unit? Uh, I think eventually, yeah. Because okay, at what stage do you need a unit for your business? For my business, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd like to have a unit now. I think, but obviously it's got to make sense financially. But it's for me, it's more so giving the experience to the customer. Mm-hmm. So same way you'd have uh, p- customers come down for Evolve um, and that they can sit down here, wait for the cars to be done or something. I kind of want that to be done mm-hmm. where they can come to the place. They can take photos in the photo booth. Um, or even if we're doing podcasts, you can come down there where it's a proper setup, proper studio, have a cinema room where once I've done the wedding film, They've got a TV size of the whole wall, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of just experience. Do you know what so I mean? So you don't need a lot of space, really, well, for what you're describing. I don't, I don't know how big... I mean, this would be too big, obviously. Yeah. Maybe something like your previous unit around that sort of size. Yeah, I mean, round here, it re- again, depends. If you, yeah, you, you're from London. London, yeah. London costs are ridiculous. Stupid, yeah. yeah. You know, my business partner's from London. Would we have a unit in London? No. Yeah. Where we have a unit halfway, no, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Because like where we are here is relatively cheap compared to, to London and the rates are lower. And I'm going to have to do a blood you know that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have to commute. <laughs> but then you, I would like, from, from your perspective, I'd really seriously think about whether you need yeah. a unit. Obviously it's nice, but like the costs can grow. I mean, even myself, we didn't have a unit for uh, 18 months or something like that. You know, mm. before we we started a business, as I said, I was in my bedroom yeah. for a while and then I was in a serviced office for a while. And yeah. Then I, I grew out from there, but I think what you're describing, you could possibly have in service, serviced office. So but it keeps you, you flexible because once you come into 
um, a, a unit and you yeah. have to sign a contract lease for five, six years, you know, you're, you're locked yeah. into that. But what, uh, obviously not buying the unit, but a rent, rent. Yeah, even yeah. rental I'm talking yeah. about. You're still locked into that lease, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. For of course, a yeah. But then service years. office, you can't, I mean, do like customize it how you'd want it. You can't put a partition in the middle or anything like that, could you? You'd have to, I mean, if you, <laughs> you have, have a one with it. a big space, you might be able to do something with it. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm just giving you advice yeah, as, a, yeah, yeah. As, a, as a friend. It's like you, you don't need to have a unit yeah, no, straight that. away and then your overheads are, are crazy. You mm. really, I would build up the business and actually have the income ready first before you make that Yeah, yeah no, jump. inshallah, that's the, that's the plan anyway. Yeah. Like. So how, how do you do it in marketing then? As in... Yeah, so marketing-wise, we don't... Like, when I first started uh, the business in 2007, it was very traditional yeah. marketing. It was um, magazine advertising. Um, it was... Uh, very paper-based. Yeah, very paper-based. There were, like, social media wasn't really a thing. Around, yeah. Um, at the time, uh, car internet forums yeah. were coming up. Um, so the businesses that were advertising in in the magazines were very well established business. So they obviously had good cash flow and they were putting into magazines and they were getting it back. And when you're first starting, you can't afford £500 for a month yeah. magazine advert and £1,000 a month for a magazine advert in yeah. some of them. I mean, I'm talking about like BMW car magazines, proper magazine, magazines. you know, at that time, mm. uh, which are all kind of almost dead now, non-existent. Yeah, I mean, no one really buys uh, magazines no, yeah. anymore. Um, so we started on internet forums before people started like really that. cottoning on that that's where everything was happening and yeah you know it was more community based and it was like cheap to advertise on there and you'd get a lot of customers it was a very good way of building up quick yeah business um, and then as we've progressed <clears throat> internet forums kind of started to die down and then social media started to take its place instagram Facebook, so instagram was very very instrumental yeah in us growing all of our brands and especially even chewy because it's very visual um, I think we went from 2014 to now, I think we've got 52,000 subs, like completely. On YouTube? Or no, on um, Instagram. 52,000 followers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> completely organically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, like not paid for nothing. Uh, really good like interaction good rates. Engagement stuff, yeah. Um, and that helped us grow that brand worldwide because you get people everywhere using Instagram, you, Thailand, yeah. China, you name it. You know, Everyone people, around the world using it. People yeah. are using it everywhere, so they're, they're picking it up. Um, and then after Instagram for us came, um, Facebook was very good at the beginning yeah. when you didn't have to pay for it. Like, and the engagement was really wide. Uh, and then they started to do ads. The ads still work, but you have to be very clever with how you do how them. You it, yeah. And then we moved like a lot of it to YouTube. So it, there came a point where I essentially stopped doing, um, magazine adverts, stopped doing forum advertising. Yeah. And I put all of that money into media production, which is now what you see on our YouTube channel. Yeah. So I took that step to have a full-time media. And that's when you hired Matt. Matt, yeah, uh, production. And I think we're the first people in the UK to especially to do that. Yeah. And then we put all of that into uh, content marketing on YouTube. Um, and so we seriously started using YouTube channel probably, what, two and a bit years ago, maybe? Mm. So initially I was contracting Matt. Yeah. So this is and how then, I like to work. Him, yeah. I like I like to try things like on a on a non formal basis first, yeah. and then see how it goes, yeah. and then say okay. So with Matt, it was like okay, I pay him per video, see how it goes. The video started to do well, and then it got to the point where I need to employ this guy yeah. full time, and I just need to take that again risk that and step. just yeah. just just do it full time content. Try and do two videos a week, which is what we try and do, unless. Like the weather lets us down a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it sounds funny, it but it's. Would it's, you say that's one of the best decisions you made? A hundred percent, because that I think we discussed it in the last podcast. Yeah. But I mean, Elevate not only to a not level. only the amount of business that has grown out of it, but the collaboration opportunities that have come yeah. from it are amazing because people notice you on there everywhere. Yeah. You know, and then it's quite funny because people see you on YouTube and they're like, "Oh, you're new." And like, no, no we're, not. <laughs> we're not new. And then they start looking into, you, oh, you guys have been around for ages. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. we were getting a lot of comments like that initially on our videos saying, oh, who are you guys? You're like, you're new to this game. Yeah. And then like, they've obviously gone away, looked Done at research, how long we've yeah. been around. They're like, oh, sorry, I just <laughs> yeah, like, found just stuff from 2007. So <laughs> yeah. you guys have been around for a while. Yeah. I think there's, there's not a lot of places that are doing the YouTube in terms of automotive anyway. Like, yeah, not not in this not country. Not that I can immediately. No. In America, kind of it's big. Of, I mean, you got like yeah. RDB. You got there's loads of places in America. Yeah, yeah. 
but that's I think that's very uh, they got a much bigger com- car community than us. Yeah, it's huge. Way um, I mean, I go to LA every year. The car community there is massive. Yeah. And if we look at where we sell a lot of our product, it's, it's in LA. LA yeah. yeah, it's California. Like the weather's nice all the time. Big car community, lots of money. So it's yeah. like kind of the perfect. Do you, do you get to, to see do. like where the end consumer is? Because obviously, like you said, your customer is the distributor. Yeah. But then, do they give you the information of who's actually got it in terms of the end? Well, we see it on Instagram. Thing. People tag us. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> so I see, I see on Instagram, people tag us all the time. Like they put the product on the car and they yeah. share stories and all that kind of stuff. Bloody hell. Um, so yeah, and going back to the content marketing, that's probably for us where it's at. It's in between social media yeah. marketing, content marketing, because we have a lot of stuff going on. So for us, it's just like, let's capture it in an interesting way and put it up and organically it gets views and people see it and they, I guess they feel like there's more of a connection because they see how everything's done and how we're working on stuff. Yeah. So they feel a bit more connected than just taking it to a random place where, okay, it's got good name and they've been around, but we're not familiar. Here you, you see the people working yeah. on your car. You see where your car's going to go. You see everything. You see everything there. on camera. So I think that builds a bit of... Because not only are you going to make the content, but obviously they're going to make the content as well. For example, Ricky's M5. Yeah. Is, was, is that part of the... like? The yeah, so that comes scheme. into the whole, like, uh, that's a, a collaboration, isn't it? Mm. Between us and, and, and Ricky. Ricky. Yeah. We've been working with him since he was, like, his channel wasn't that Yeah, yeah that no, big. When, when he had his, uh, I think he came E92. from... E92. Yeah, that's it, yeah, the yeah, back one, so yeah. Yeah, so he had his E92, and, like, it's worked really well for us. His his viewership, a lot of people will think, oh, it doesn't match our customer base, but it does. It does like, yeah. a lot of our customers cool. watch his stuff and like it. I mean, some people might think it is, it's polarizing, and they might not, but for us, I can, I know that when we do stuff with him, we yeah. see what what, what comes, it brings, what yeah. it brings, and the same for Joe Achilles as well. I mean, he's been doing some stuff with us recently, and so that's the other aspect of it. So you got social media, you got yeah. content, and then you've got influencer. So then, marketing. So for example, the influencer marketing um, with the builds that goes on, how does it work? Obviously, I don't want to talk figures. That's like no, they, they. If you're talking about a big build, people got to pay. That's not. That's not. Yeah, no, can't no. do that for that's free. free. <laughs> it wouldn't be free, but then obviously it would be. What would it be a cost price or? Yeah, I mean it depends on who the person is and how much reach you they, they have. have but yeah. like you, you'd be. I think you'd be a bit crazy to do a, a full free. build like yeah. that. Especially we, we're still a business. We still have to pay for stuff. pay for the bills and yeah. do everything. But it's just a balance and depends who the person is and if you've worked with them before and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But I mean, inf- you can't ignore influencer. Marketing. No, no, it's, it's a not, thing no. now. It's massive. I mean, depending on how big the person is, you might get a bit of a discount. Yeah. And it, like, if you're asking, if you're talking about free, that person has to have a huge, huge reach, Social media and, following, yeah. and <laughs> it has to be relevant. Yeah. There's no good somebody having 1.3 million, but they're in a whole different sector. But they're in a whole different sector just because they've got 1.3 million and they're like in in fashion. Realistically, it doesn't really mean anything to me. It's like, what is their car content like? Yeah. You know. But then even even then, like for example, uh, I'll give you an example. I don't know if I'm. I should, I'm allowed to say this really, but when I was chatting to Mike Montek, mm. um, he's done some influence on marketing before, but then even though they may be YouTubers or they're in cars, but it doesn't do anything for their business. So how do you know who to allow as a part of the marketing I look side? At, I, like? I look at everything. So because it's I'm in a unique situation because I'm an influencer yeah, myself, yeah, right? Yeah. So people you like come to me, and say, can you help us yeah, do, because you're in the space do something? Because yeah. I'm in that space. So I have a unique perspective on it because I, I, I know how it works from both. both. I know what I can bring to the table and what position I'm in. Yeah. And I know what the manufacturer or the person or the brand who wants to work with me yeah. expects. I don't even need to have a contract with that person. They know what I'm going to deliver because I know what I expect from to yeah. be delivered. And and then that gives me a unique perspective. And when I'm looking for somebody to work with, yeah, I look at their social media account. I look at the interaction they're having and all that kind of stuff. And I can pretty much figure out myself whether it's going to be worth it and what is worth it. So yeah. that's what I'm talking about. There's a scale. There's a scale of getting some discount and then mm. there's a scale of getting like free, but that free is... Very minimal. Very, very, very small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, we get emails and like... DMs and stuff all the time from people. I've got a big Instagram account and like do Seriously? free stuff. Yeah, it happens all the time. Bloody hell. <laughs> That's mad. Like, yeah. 
people have the balls to ask that really. Yeah, they do, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they do. So it depends. I and mean, it's getting to the point where we get so many emails and messages like yeah. that. It's just like, I'm going to just have something on the website. Saying no free sponsor, No sponsorships. <laughs> and then, like, literally have drop down and have a minimum requirement. Yeah. And if they don't meet the minimum requirement, well, then... They do not then get the sponsorship, basically. Yeah. Nothing, nothing happens. It's just a way of filtering it. So what would oh. be your minimum requirement? For Instagram, it's usually 10,000 engaged followers. So, yeah. like, I can tell the difference between a 10,000 account that has engaged followers and one that's bought followers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can you could tell that, yeah. Go through a few posts and see have a look at how many people likes, are commenting and liking like, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. That makes you can, sense. You can soon see. Yeah, I mean, I've had people message me for a podcast, yeah. And the thing is, sometimes you don't know if they're genuine or not because they're saying, yeah, yeah, I have all, all this reach. And before I even press accept, obviously, I'm reading it. And yeah. then I go on the account and look at, yeah, cool, you've got 500,000 followers, but why have you only got 500 likes yeah. on that post free comments like this doesn't make sense yeah then those numbers how are you verified then, and yeah then you know yeah and yeah. then then i was just like you know forget you you're done i don't know what it is do you know yeah, what I mean? it's not only that um i think your your time is valuable right yeah so you have to use your time mm. effectively for me the, the the example would be when we're deciding to make a product yeah like we get asked to make like products for all types of different cars yeah and i have to look at how many cars are sold are the people who are buying the cars going to be willing to spend the money that our products are? Mm. And we kind of make our decision based off that. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a similar process, right? You mm. have to use your time effectively. If you can only do like one or two podcasts mm. a week, you yeah. have to choose who you want to do those podcasts with. Yeah. But you're right. On the other hand, depending on who you do them with, then that will reflect on who wants to do them yeah, with you. So future, you do yeah. have to get picky. At yeah. So yeah, no, and there's no I'm, harm in that. But I've, I don't know, it's hard, like, rejecting people, almost. Yeah. But it's just... <laughs> it happens. It it's happens, happen, isn't it? It's life. <laughs> so, just before we end the podcast, you know the questions come in. What does success... <laughs> <laughs> what does success mean to you? <laughs> um, yeah, I get asked this a lot. Success to me um, is waking up every morning, like, even on a Monday morning, yeah. and actually wanting to get into work, and having enough money to cover my basic bills. Like, honestly, I know... Like people see my Instagram and whatever and they think I'm about the cars and all that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, they're nice. Don't get me wrong. I'm yeah. happy and I'm blessed as long to as have access bills, to them. Yeah. But for me, on a basic level, I'm happy coming into work. My family's happy with me. They're all in a nice place. Yeah. And my basic bills are getting covered. Uh, Alhamdulillah, that's all I need. Content, yeah. Yeah, I'm content. Alhamdulillah, yeah. I think a lot of time, people need to learn to be content with what they have first. And then try, try and, and aim for, for something else forward. Yeah. If you keep thinking, I'm not going to be content until I have that. the next thing or the next thing or the next you thing. You will never get that thing. You will never get that thing. Yeah. Yeah. It will always just be there. You will always be just be chasing after it and it will always keep running away from you. So you got to appreciate what you've got in the moment. Yeah. Compared to anything else. I mean, look, I've been doing this for a long time. I've not always been in this mm. position. I've started from nothing and I've struggled for many years. So yeah. I'm blessed now that I have all this stuff, but I, that contentment thing has always been there with me right from the beginning. Yeah. I can't say I'm any happier now than I was like when I started the business, honestly. It's like, so even like we were saying earlier in the podcast that the, the, the next step, the next goal is to have an actual... I mean, build your own unit. Yeah. You're still content with everything that of there is I right am. now. Yeah. yeah, of course I am. I'm th 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 that's just my, I've trained myself to be like that. content yeah. with what I have. And I think, honestly, on the other scale of things, I've seen people uh, build big businesses up and then lose things very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always work on the premise that, like, this could be finished in, like... Just like that. Like, government regulation come in, pandemic happens. Okay, this pandemic didn't affect me, but there could be one. That does. That does. And I've always worked on the assumption mm. that this could be taken away at any time. So just appreciate Everything, what I have yeah. while I have it. If it goes, I'm not bothered. I will build it up again. Because I've done it once, I can do it again. Sick. That's a, what a way to end the podcast there. <laughs> uh, I hope you lot enjoyed that a lot. Make sure you check out part one where we go more in depth about how it all started. This one's a bit different. I wanted to sit down with Imran and see what it actually takes to run this sort of massive empire and four brands. A mad brain that Imran has. And uh, you know what? I've got to <laughs> give it to him. He's sleep. actually a proper <laughs> entrepreneur. I get messages all the time saying, I'm an entrepreneur. You're witnessing an entrepreneur right here. Thanks, um, man. <laughs> with that being said, I hope you lot all enjoyed that. 
by the time you lot have seen this, I'll be in Turkey. So there might be an episode next week. I'm not too sure yet. But anyway, until then, I hope you lot enjoy your whatever you're doing. <laughs> Make sure you subscribe, like, share this to everyone else and comment your feedback and what you think. Um, till then, catch you next time and see you your cost. Bye bye. Yeah, is that good? Yeah, it's cool. Sweet. Thank you, man. That was good. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs>